Why do people get paid what they're paid according to economic theory? Uh, let's consider the very simplest situation. We've got a brick, <clears throat> brick making company. Uh, the company itself doesn't really do anything. The workers do it. Uh, the workers go get clay out of an inexhaustible clay pit, uh, and they mold the clay into bricks. They set them out to dry in, and bake in the hot sun. Over the course of days, they cure. They become finished bricks. A company comes and picks them up and leaves a deposit of 10 cents per finished brick with the firm. Uh, most firms do more than that. They have capital equipment, they have management teams, they have all, all sorts of stuff. This firm has nothing uh, just to keep the extraneous complication out of the example. It's got two employees, uh, no other costs other than the employees. The two employees are John and Sue, the, the brick makers. And Sue uh, makes 40 bricks per hour, uh, that's her rate at which she's able to produce bricks, and John makes 30. It's a competitive market. How much will they be paid? Uh, the answer is straightforward. They'll be paid the value of what they add to the firm's bottom line. Sue makes 40 bricks. There are no other costs. The uh, brick buyer comes and picks them up and leaves on deposit with the firm a payment of $4 for every hour she works because uh, her work corresponds to 40 bricks. So she's going to get $4 per hour. That's her wage under perfect competition. What's John's going to be? $3 per hour. That doesn't mean that the competitive firm wants to pay her $4. They'd be happy to pay her $3.50. But if they paid her $3.50, there would be cash on the table. Yes. Yes, how happy I am to hear that response. <laughs> there would be cash on the table. What do you mean? That means if they paid her 350, some other firm could come along and say, look, come work for us, I'll pay you 360. And they would make 40 cents an hour of economic profit without bringing anything to the table. The, the firm that's employing her now at $4 an hour isn't making any economic profit, but that's not so disappointing because it's not doing anything. Basically, it, it's not adding any value. The worker adds all the value. In the market, we see a demand curve for labor. It's downward sloping. The more workers you hire, the lower uh, the output that each successive one adds. That's roughly speaking the law of diminishing returns. We multiply the, the number of units of outputs uh, output the, the worker adds by the price of the output, net of any materials cost, and that's the value of the worker's marginal product. That's the demand curve for labor. The supply curve is just a schedule representing the reservation wages of the workers. At a wage of uh, a certain amount, how many hours would workers want to work in total? If the wage were higher, how many would they want to work? I've drawn it to be upward sloping. It might not be. It might be completely vertical. It could even be U-shaped or backward bending, uh, as indeed some aggregate labor supply curves appear to be. If we're talking about the supply curve to one particular market, uh, a small market out of the total, probably the labor supply curve is upward sloping because it's really asking what would happen to the number of people who want to offer their services in that market if wages went up there but didn't go up in other markets. Well, people would switch from other markets to come offer their services in this one, in that case. So upward sloping supply curves for individual markets make a lot of sense. One of the main reasons some people earn more than others, even though they don't uh, seem any more productive intrinsically, is because of compensating wage differentials. How many of you hope you'll be able to get a job with pro-septic service when you get out of the Johnson School? Uh, were you, were you uh, applying to business school hoping for a job uh, with them uh, when you came? Uh, you realized you might not be lucky enough to land an interview, but, but uh, still that was your hope. I'm going to guess no for most of you. Most of you were not thinking to go to work for them. Uh, 
the entry level jobs working for them uh, in particular are not pleasant. Uh, they're, they're, uh, they have uh, aversive characteristics. To get people to work there, you got to pay extra. People won't work there unless you pay extra. Some people object that, well, the people who work there uh, don't seem to be earning much. Well, maybe the people who work there uh, aren't earning much because they weren't very productive to begin with. If you would control for their productivity, they're earning more than you would expect them to earn on that basis. I have not studied that industry, so I don't know. But I do know that if the work was considered unpleasant, you would have to pay people more than they normally could get in order to get them to do it. So here's an example. Summer jobs, Two, 20 Cornell undergraduates from the same small northeastern town want summer jobs. There are two possibilities. They can be lifeguards at the local beach. There are 10 op openings for, for that job. Or they can be sanitation workers. Uh, there are 10 openings there. Skill requirements for the two jobs are the same. I'm assuming everybody knows how to swim and then there's just a, a few hours training. How do you pick up garbage? How do you pull people out of the water, that's, and, and you're ready to go either way. 20, all 20 uh, job seekers, unsurprisingly, view the beach job as the more attractive conditions of the two. What would happen if the city posted the same wage for the two jobs? You know what would happen. All 20 applicants would apply for the beach job, and nobody would apply for the sanitation job. How would the directors of the two departments respond if they're normal? Uh, the, the lifeguard director would say, I don't need to pay this much. I can use some of my budget for other purposes. I'm going to cut the wage until I've not, no longer got an excess supply of workers. The wage premium uh, that the garbage collectors get uh, in turn, he'll have to wait, raise, <clears throat> raise the offer for them or he won't be able to get people to fill the jobs that he's trying to fill. That's known as a positive compensating wage differential. It's a payment to compensate you for the fact that the job you're doing is one that most people would rather not do. The di differential goes the other direction for the lifeguards. If it's considered an unusually attractive job, they'll actually get paid less than normal for working in that job. The numbers that attach to compensating wage differentials, either pos positive or negative, are amazingly big in some cases. Some of the biggest ones are for doing what people would describe in some cases as morally satisfying work. So people seem to have strong feelings about uh, what they do during the day. If you can go home at night and say, I made the world a little bit better place today. Uh, many people think that's a desirable characteristic in a job. Very few people uh, feel good if they go home at the end of the day and they have to say to themselves, because of, what, because of what I did today, a lot of additional people are gonna die premature deaths. How do you get yourself to feel good about that? That's, that's a tough order. Uh, so given a choice between a job where you could say, uh, I did some good today, and an alternative job offer where you, where you could have to uh, acknowledge truthfully that you're doing real harm to other people, uh, most people, you would think, would choose the, the job where you do some good. We, we put this idea to the test by asking Cornell seniors to say, which job would you take? out of this pair. So in one case, you could write ad copy for the American Cancer Society trying to discourage kids from smoking. That was job one. This was 20 years ago, this study. The opening salary for this job was $30,000. You got an office, you got a travel budget, you got this and that. Uh, that was one choice. The other choice was to work for RJR, and you would write ad copy urging kids to try camel cigarettes. You got the same size office, the same travel budget, the same furniture, everything else was the same. $30,000 salary there too. Which job would you choose? 
Which job would you choose if you were in that situation? Well, the 88% of the, the people that uh, were in the survey I did chose the American Cancer Society job. Why not 100%? You never get 100% in a, in a survey. There's always somebody who's willing to fool with you a little bit or, or else, you know, who knows, maybe, maybe you had an uncle who had stock in the company. Or, not everybody chooses the way you expect them, but most people did. Then we asked how big a premium would they have to offer you to get you to switch. So you're working for the American Cancer Society for $30,000. You feel pretty good about that. What if we gave you a million dollars? Would you go work for the American? Yeah, yeah, most of them would. How much would they have to pay you to get you to switch? The median pay premium was 50%. The average pay premium for, the, for, for that particular pair of jobs was $24,000, almost double. OK, maybe, maybe that's an odd pair of jobs. Let's look at another pair. Uh, after graduating, you're going to uh, pursue a career as a lawyer. You have two job offers. One is to be a lawyer for the National Rifle Association. The other one is to be a lawyer for the Sierra Club. Which would you pick? Or, no right answer. Which would you pick? What's the Sierra Club? What's the Sierra Club? Sierra Club is an environmental organization. It promotes a good environment. I'm not going to try to get any more specific than that. 94% of uh, our respondents chose Sierra Club. The median pay premium for switching was a little smaller in this case, interestingly enough, uh, 10000 The average pay premium was considerably bigger, uh, so there was a lot more spread. Uh, where, where did you take the survey? Yeah. In Ithaca, New York. <laughs> I can report to you on that very issue. I have a, a, a colleague who is teaching at VPI in Virginia. She read this paper and uh, wrote to me that she did the survey with her stu students. And just as you suspected, most of them say they have worked for the NRA. So what this uh, survey tells you is that, that it's not that there are good jobs and bad jobs, it's that how people feel about the jobs determines how much you have to pay them to get them to do the jobs. So in Virginia, maybe you could give people a pay cut if they worked for the NRA. In New York, you'd have to give them a pay premium to get them to work for the NRA. Fair point. You could criticize both of these questions and the dozen others in the survey that we did by saying it's all cheap talk. Oh, they say they, they choose the, 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 the Cancer Society job and wouldn't go uh, work for the RJR uh, uh, position unless they paid them 50% more. But in the real world, people have loan, student loans to pay. They've got other obligations. Uh, they got things they want to buy. What would they really do? Here, I think to get firmer evidence, we've got to look to the actual labor market where people are revealing by what they choose how they feel about these sorts of things. One nice uh, pair of jobs that we can use for a comparison like that is the starting salaries we see at public interest law firms like the ACLU in Manhattan where the people who, who take those jobs work very long hours and they're under tight deadline pressures and the like. They get paid, or in 1989, got paid $28,000 for doing those jobs. If they instead worked for an elite corporate law firm in New York, they worked the same long hours and had deadlines, they got paid $89,000, three times as much. And these are not a comparison of smart people working here and dumb people working here. That might sort of cloud the meaning of the comparison. These are law review students from Harvard and Yale, typically. Everybody uh, who, who is ambitious in the law uh, uh, and wants to work in the, in the nonprofit sector would find that a, a plum job. They would want to work there. People who are ambitious to work in the private sector would find that uh, a, a plum. They get the very top students in both of those jobs, and yet the salary is one-third as great in one case as in the other case. 
Do people care about the mission of the employer? Uh, I think it's obvious that they do from evidence like this. Uh, and we know further that the private law firms uh, were offering candidates to, in order, as a recruitment inducement, they were offering them six to eight weeks off in the summer to do pro bono work for a client of their choosing. They had an intuition that good people would be more likely to come and work there if they offered them the chance to do that than if they had to work for the same corporate clients that they'd be working for all, all the rest of the year. Uh, somebody asked, uh, well, isn't it just that the ACLU can't afford to pay as much? Yeah, they can't afford to pay as much. The question, though, is why good people would accept a job there uh, when they could get a job that paid three times as much? The answer has to be that they would rather work at the ACLU for a third of the salary than work for Skadden Arps at the, at the, at the full salary. It's not to impugn either group. Uh, you know, private law firms perform a service, uh, but people, it looks like from the evidence, would rather do that job if the pay were the same. The reason they, that some people don't do that job is that they're paid much, much more to do the other job. Who are these guys? Anybody know? 12 Angry Men. 12 Angry Men. <laughs> They're the CEOs of the large tobacco companies. It's an interesting group. They've just been sworn to tell the whole truth and nothing but the truth in a congressional hearing. And then each one of them in succession says, all but one of them in a deep southern accent, I believe that nicotine is not addictive, <laughs> which was a lie. Uh, they were known to have studies in their vaults for decades showing that nicotine is the most or one of the most addictive substances known to humans. Uh, I had a friend who was a heroin addict. He said it was way easier to quit heroin than it was to quit smoking. Uh, and others uh, make similar reports. It's an extremely addictive substance and tobacco companies make a lot of money precisely because it's an extremely addictive substance, and yet here these men were testifying under oath in public that they believed it was not addictive, knowing full well that that was a lie. Why did they do that? They got a huge pay premium for doing that. The CEOs of tobacco companies get paid a whole lot more than the CEOs of comparable size companies. Why? Because what they do is at least by some people regarded as noxious. People don't want to do it generally. Now you could say that the premium they get uh, is smaller than it would be if they were randomly chosen people from the population. These are probably the people whose sensibilities about this issue are the dullest uh, among CEO candidates. Just as you might say, uh, houses on busy, noisy streets sell for less precisely because they're noisy. But because there are a lot of deaf people in the world who don't care whether it's noisy, the, the, the discount you get on those houses isn't as great as it would be if you had to fill them full of people who could, see, who could hear well. Uh, similar here, if there are morally deaf people uh, in the world, you can fill these jobs without have, having to pay too big a premium. Uh, but it doesn't change the general uh, direction of the argument. It just changes the magnitudes of the numbers involved. And the numbers are big. Uh, so if you want to know why some people earn more than others, there are compensating differentials of all different sorts. Some jobs are safer than others. Some jobs offer more prestige than others. Some jobs involve morally compromising uh, situations to a greater extent than others. Uh, and those differences are reflected in the pay people get in the labor market. Earl. I would say uh, they are very powerfully uh, uh, induced to, to take positions that they might not believe. Yeah. Yeah. 
We know that when the payoff from, from doing an act increases, people are more likely to do the act, and that's pretty much applicable to any act. Uh, sometimes you have to pay a lot more to get people to do it, sometimes only a little, little more. But that's, that's what the economic model predicts, and that's pretty much what we do expect to see in most, most cases. Okay, I'm going to focus now on income inequality. Why do some people earn so much more now than the, the same people earned in the past while the earnings of others have bar barely moved uh, compared to earlier decades? Uh, the pattern of change is what physicists call fractal. It's the same no matter what level we look at it, no matter what uh, uh, domain we inspect, we see the same basic pattern, which is that the people at the bottom of the group, they haven't, uh, not only haven't earned any more than before, their wages have actually gone down in real terms. People in the middle, they've seen in some groups a, a little bit of growth, not much. It's, it's only the top of each group that has experienced significant income growth. Ever since 1969 or, or 70 or 71, we're, we're debating when the change started, but roughly around that time. It's the same pattern for college graduates. The people at the bottom of, of the group of, of uh, people with college degrees haven't seen their earnings grow much in the last four decades in real terms. That means in inflation-adjusted terms. People in the middle have grown a little. The people at the top have captured almost all the gains in earnings that college graduates have accrued during that time. It's true for dentists. The bottom dentists are earning less than they were 40 years ago. The people in the middle are earning a little more. There's a handful of dentists at the top who have captured almost all the earnings gains in the dentistry profession, and they've seen their earnings grow many multiples in the last four decades. It's true of the top 1%. If you look in that group, it's the top one-tenth of 1% 1 that's captured most of the gains in the top 1%. And you keep going inside, and it's the same pattern again and again and again. For CEOs, it used to be, uh, in 1980, they earned 40 times roughly what the average worker earned. More than tenfold increase in that ratio uh, between then and 2001. It's been fluctuating since then, but since the 2008 recession, most of the growth that we've seen has been in the very top of the income ladder. So why, why is this going on? The standard explanation offered by economists for why some people earn more than others is that they have more human capital. They have more, it's an amalgam. You have experience, education, training, innate ability, social skills, all the things that affect your productivity. We, we make an index of those things. Uh, we put the proper weights on each one. That index is a measure of your human capital. Somebody with twice as much as someone else would be expected to earn twice as much income because he has twice as much human capital. The human capital explanation for why earnings are different across people or across time doesn't seem to get you any purchase here. The distribution of human capital has not become more unequal during the last four decades. It's unequal, to be sure, but it's not dramatically more unequal than it used to be. So how can that be the explanation for rising inequality? Interestingly enough, people are getting smarter year by year, as measured by conventional IQ tests. They have to keep renorming the tests so that the mean will still be 100. If they gave you the same tests they, they gave your grandparents and scored them the same way they scored those tests, you'd have an average IQ of 120, not 100. They keep norm it down so it stays 100. Why is that happening? There, there's a lot of interesting dis discussion about that, but none of it's relevant for the issue of why we have increased inequality because the distribution of IQ scores hasn't gotten more unequal over, over the years. It's just gone up in tandem. Changes in distribution of human capital, not an explanation. Foreign competition at the low end, yeah, that's in man some manufacturing cases we see People who had good livings here saw their positions undercut once it was cheap enough to ship goods from low-wage countries far away, and the treaties allowed that. Their, their positions did get weaker. 
But that's not the explanation either in, in the broadest sense, because look at dentists. Dentists don't face any foreign competition. Do you, do you know an Ithaca dentist who's worried about what the dentists in, in Bombay are charging? Uh, that's, you know, there, there are actually examples of people who buy a, a dental tourism package. You go, you see the Taj Mahal, you get dental implants done at a clinic in India, all for the same money it would have cost you to get the dental implants here, airfare, for first class seat, everything included. Uh, but there aren't very many people doing that. Uh, and so the dentists, their incomes here are not really affected by that in any material way. Technical change favoring the most educated workers. This sounds impressive, uh, and many ec economists cite this as a reason, but this isn't the explanation either, although it has some purchase in, in individual cases. Uh, the, the college graduates have the same pattern as everyone else uh, in terms of their changes in earnings pa patterns. Uh, so technical change favoring educated workers, it doesn't favor them all equally if that's the case. Another possibility is one that uh, my, my uh, friend, the Duke University economist Philip Cook and I uh, called the spread and intensification of a particular form of market structure, one we've long seen in sports and entertainment, but which has now spread uh, widely in other parts of the economy. We call them winner-take-all markets. They're markets where reward depends on the relative performance of the actors, not the absolute performance of them. And being just a little bit better than the next best performer often means earning thousands of times as big a reward. So it's as if we paid brick makers, not by the number of bricks they make, but by according to who makes the most bricks. And why that might be so in some markets, uh, I hope will become clear from some examples. Basically, it's that the, the best performance can extend their reach to a broader swath of the market now than before. Everybody wants to see the best performers play. If you had a, a chance to see a tennis match and you could pick who to watch, you'd want to see Nadal play Federer. Uh, most people would pick uh, one of the top players uh, as, as their preferred match to see. Uh, well, now everybody can see Nadal play Federer. In the old days, you had to go and watch people play in person, and uh, there were uh, jobs enough for ev everybody to, to, to earn a, a, a modest living on the tour. Uh, once the, the TV gate became the dominant share of revenue, the income started piling up on the top ranked performers because those were the people that people, the audience really wanted to see. And now that the mode of delivering their product to the, the audience was TV and not in person, it was possible for everyone to see them. They had greater reach, greater leverage. Why did Steffi Graf earn twice as much in 1994 as she did in 1993? She was playing at the top of her game all through that decade. Well, TV rights? TV rights, no, there, you know, it could have had something to do with that, but the, the conspicuous change that occurred was uh, she had a lot of endorsements both years. The big change was that Monica, Monica Sellis wasn't playing in 1994. She'd been stabbed in the back in a tournament at Hamburg, a, a deranged fan of Steffi Graf, ran onto the court and stabbed Monica Sellis in the back. And Sellis was off the tour for 18 months. She, she, months. she never came uh, back to full form after that. Uh, and Graf won twice as much money the next year, playing at the same absolute standard, because how much you win depends on your rank, not on how you play in absolute terms. So where do these kind of markets come from uh, if, it, if it's not from something literally in sports or entertainment? Uh, we can now clone what the best performers do. If, if it's, a, if it's a, a, a song, uh, we used to have to go listen to the song in person. Now we listen to it in recorded form. And there's no limit to how many copies we can make at essentially zero marginal cost once we figure out what the best version of the song might be. In 1900, uh, there were 
1,300 opera houses in the state of Iowa alone. I heard this on an NPR uh, segment one morning. I couldn't believe it. Uh, they were talking about the sound effects for making thunder when they're in, in a theater. If, they, if the scene called for thunder and lightning, they'd have some, something that would explode and make a flash, but then they'd have to coordinate this complex uh, a piece of equipment that would, would make a rumbling sound like thunder. And he just said matter-of-factly matter that this equipment was widely available. There were 1,300 and some opera houses in Iowa that had, what? In Iowa, 1,300 opera houses. I tracked the guy down. Okay, that has to be a mistake. I reached him on the telephone. No. It was, it was 1,340 opera houses in Iowa. Rinky-dink steak. Uh, uh, <laughs> then as now, not very many people live there, 1,300 opera houses. He didn't mean literally classical opera houses, but live music halls where you could do opera. Uh, if you wanted to hear music, you went. You had, to go, you had to go someplace to see it. And everybody wanted to hear the best performers, but the best performers couldn't be in 1,300 different places at once, never mind the total number that there were all around the world. And so there was a brisk market for thousands of performers. Now, how many tenors are there? Ask your friends to name tenors. I, wanna, I want you to tell me if any of your friends can name more than three. Uh, I'm guessing most of your friends can't name even three, even if you'll allow some of them to be dead tenors. Uh, they won't be able to name them. We don't need very many tenors anymore. Uh, you got three tenors who did the recordings. We can stamp out copies of their recordings at zero marginal cost. That's the way people listen to tenors now. Oh, what about the people who go to the opera? Well, there aren't that many people going to the opera anymore. They're going to theaters like, like the ones in Ithaca and Elmira and Binghamton that are doing HD broadcasts of the Metropolitan Opera performances out of New York City. So that again and again, a handful of performers can now extend their reach much more broadly, and that concentrates income in their hands, and it cuts off income in the hands of others. The tax industry, a very vivid example of this phenomenon. The first wave of change in this industry, it used to be a local accountant industry. You'd go see your accountant for tax advice. Uh, if you had a big account, you'd get the best ac accountant. If you had a pretty big account, you'd get a slightly less able accountant, and you'd, the accounts would sort of shuffle on down the list. Then came H&R Block. What was their insight? You didn't need an accountant to do most of the things that were required for filling out a, a taxpayer's tax return. High school students could do it after a short training course. So they hired a bunch of high school students and they had them do the tax returns. They had a couple of accountants in the back room. If you run into a complication, go ask one of them. Uh, and they would do that, and they'd, they'd settle whatever the, the ambiguous question was. And they, they swept through the industry. They, they stole business from the local accountants uh, at, at very, uh, uh, on a very broad front with obvious consequences for the distribution of income in that industry. H&R Block's proprietors got a bundle of money and the accountants basically end up suffering stagnation in their earnings. Uh, the next wave was the user-friendly tax software. Most people do their own taxes now, unless they uh, re have really complicated stuff to deal with. And that meant that there were scores of computer programs battling it out, uh, trying to win the endorsement of critics as the best program, because once we figure out which the best program is, the, the most user-friendly, comprehensive one, why do we need the second best one? Once one gets to be the best, it'll have a cumulative advantage and get better and better, faster than any of the others. We'll, we'll all use TurboTax in the end. Maybe, is, is somebody using tax cut anymore? Is it, uh, that used to be the number two program, is it even uh, uh, still in existence any longer. Leverage is what's really uh, uh, going on in a lot of these examples. If you have more leverage, the change in the quality of the performance matters more in, in a very transparent way. So if it's a good performance by a general, that matters more than a good performance by a corporal. 
which matters more than a good performance by a private. Uh, that's always been true, but the, the, the leverage has magnified in recent decades. The scale of what's going on in large corporations has grown roughly in the same proportion as the size of average CEO pay. The value of a good decision in the CEO suite is much higher now than it used to be. The cost of a bad decision in that suite is much higher than it used to be. Somebody will object, oh, the CEOs, that's all their cronies on their boards. That's why they're getting such high salaries. Uh, even the bad CEOs get high salaries. What, how do you explain that with your market model? Uh, it's not that hard to respond to objections like that. The, the, the job categories that we see in the world have going rates. The NBA coaches all get roughly the same salary. The better ones get more than the worse ones, but the, 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 the bad ones get high salaries too. What happens to them? They get fired in short order. If you lose season after season, if you're a CEO and you don't deliver results, they paid you a lot when they announced your appointment. They said, we expect him to really turn things around here. And so we pay him the going rate. What are they going to pay him a low salary and say, we think we've hired a schlemiel, but maybe it'll work out? No, you want to say, we, got, we hired somebody really good and we've paid him accordingly. But then he doesn't deliver, out you go. You're done. The leash. Uh, on the corporate CEO contract is way shorter now than it was in 1970 when CEOs didn't earn as much. Here's an example close to home. People who were involved in the search that resulted in the appointment of David Scorton as Cornell's president about a decade ago uh, were looking for a president who could lead the university's $4 billion capital campaign, which was just announced uh, at the time. Four billion dollars. No university had ever attempted to raise anything like that amount of money in a capital campaign. There was no other task the president was going to have to attend to that was anywhere near as important uh, for the university's future as being good at doing that. And so the people that we interviewed, we were trying to size up, would they be good at that? And we. Uh, uh, talked to hundreds of candidates, this was the person who everybody thought would be the best at that. There's a psychological concept. It's called just noticeable difference. So if I have two light bulbs here, one has 100 watts, the other one has 102 watts, and I flip the switch and they both go on, I say, which one is brighter? You'll look back and forth, and just under half of you will get it wrong. Maybe 52% will say the, the 102 watt bulb is brighter. It's got to be 103 or 104 watts before most people start to say, yeah, that one's the one that's brighter and, and be reliable in their assessment. So we all thought he would be better. What does that mean? I'm saying that means we thought he would be, what, 3% better than the next best guy, 4% better. Uh, I think he would have been way, a, a way bigger gap than that, but we wouldn't have even had an opinion about it unless we thought he would have been 3% better. I heard him speak uh, 30 times. Uh, he was incredibly good at selling the university's mission to groups outside, alumni and others. The first time I ever saw him, he was, uh, I was at the, the State Theater. I was there to see the New Orleans Jazz Orchestra perform. The, the leader of the orchestra after the first intermission said, uh, I'd like to welcome David Scorton to the stage. Uh, I knew he'd been appointed uh, to be the president starting next year. He bounded out of his seat, clarinet in hand, uh, jumped up onto the stage and played a set uh, as the lead clarinetist uh, in in a, f a couple of feature numbers. Uh, I couldn't tell. He wasn't a longtime member of the orchestra. Apparently, he, he was a jazz historian. He had a, a, a very widely uh, uh, listened to FM jazz uh, 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 broadcast in the Midwest. He was a pediatric cardio cardiologist with multiple breakthrough papers. Uh, he was interesting to talk to. He was warm, funny, 
uh, uh, kind uh, in his personal dealings with people. He was a dream candidate. And we hired him, and he did terrific in that job. So what's the point? The point is, if he was just 3% better than the next best candidate, 0.03 better, on a scale, $4 billion, he, he improved Cornell's bottom line by $120 million while he was the president. He didn't get paid anything remotely like that. <laughs> the question, he was paid many hundreds of thousands of dollars, less than a million, I believe. Uh, how do I know that? Because whenever a university president gets paid more than a million, reporters call me up trying to get a quote expressing moral outrage about that. <laughs> and, and I always disappoint them. So I, I, I explain the history here. I say, what, what's surprising is that they're paid as little as they are, given the leverage that's in that position now. It didn't used to be that important who the university president was. The university would, the hierarchy was pretty much cemented in stone. The same universities were in the top 50 as, the, as were 100 years ago. But now it's much more in flux. There are hundreds of schools that want to be in the top 50, and they're spending money left and right to get into the top 50. And a few of them have, have made it, and the ones who aren't working hard to stay where they are fall behind now. So it's way more competitive now in this domain, and the, the, the effect on the bottom line has risen accordingly. And so sooner or later, university presidents will be paid millions of dollars a year. It's not necessary that they all be paid that much to, to be willing to do the jobs. We know they were willing to do the jobs when they used to get paid a tenth as much as they get paid now. But if Princeton were willing to pay him three million and Cornell said, no, we don't think it's right to pay more than 800,000, he would have been able to say, I think, I, I, in fairness to my family, I've got to take the, the other position. Uh, and, then, and then 3 million would become the going rate, and then 4 million, and so on. So that's, that's where things are headed. Network economies. Uh, I've talked to you about these. We don't need a lot of time just to remind you that these create winner-take-all markets. It doesn't have to be a better product. It just has to be more numerous, and it gets to be the chosen. Uh, uh, mode in, in the domain, the, the video uh, recording format wars, the, the computer operating system format wars. Uh, books, plays, movies, those are all network phenomena. If, if a, 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 a book gets on the bestseller list, uh, more people will read it, and that makes even more people want to read it. Uh, I'm going to talk about this in more detail next Monday. Reward by contest. Sometimes we have uh, pitched battles where the, the, the rewards are literally uh, according to who wins some debate uh, tournament or something like that. If two companies want to work, merge, it's a battle between the witnesses. Who's got the expert witnesses who can better preserve, per, uh, persuade the, the decision makers what's the right thing to do here? Personal injury lawyers, the good ones get hundreds of millions of dollars in, in fees. Uh, John Edwards, the Democratic politician was a, a big winner in that domain. He, he, was, he was a very, very wealthy man because he, he got a reputation for being good at arguing his cases, and that meant the big ticket cases came to him in preference to others. He succeeded at those. That meant even more big ticket cases came to him, and it's just a cumulative advantage process once the process gets started. These markets are tragedies of the commons in a very literal sense. I'm going to construct an example for you that's exactly parallel to the literal tragedy of the commons that we, we looked at uh, last week. And you'll see the, the complete parallel between these markets and the literal tragedy of the commons. The, the, the problem in the earlier markets w was that people had too big an incentive to enter the market with their cattle. The problem here is going to be too many people have an incentive to compete for the winner's slot in a winner-take-all market. So the structure is very simple. We've got a small nation. There are five people. They have two choices for what to do with their time. They can make pots and sell them in the world market. They'll get 12 if they do that. 
I picked 12, not out of the thin air, because that's what the, the people in the earlier example could get by investing their $100 in a bond. So 12 is the fallback option. Make pots. If you can't do anything else, make pots. Get 12. That's your, that's your, your first choice. Or you could compete for a recording contract. If you win, you get paid V, some amount V, much more than 12. If you lose, you get zero. Zero. Nothing. It's a winner-take-all contest, this recording contest. Everybody's equally likely to win. That's what the con potential contestants think. As we'll see presently, that isn't really what contestants think. The distortion that we're going to see, if they think what I'm assuming here, ends up being much, much bigger if we take into account what they really think. They don't think they're equally likely to win. They think they're almost certain to win, uh, which, if there are thousands of contestants, is probably an overestimate of their likelihood of winning. You enter the contest. If you do, then you work uh, for, for one year uh, uh, to try to get the, the contract. If you get it, you get the payment. If you, if you don't get it, you, you, you're done. You get zero, and you live on in retirement. The winner's payment increases with the number of contestants in the manner shown here. If there's one contestant, the winner gets paid 20. That's more than the 12. If there are two contestants, the odds of finding somebody good goes up. You know, the more people, nobody knows who's the best one. The more people who compete, the odds of getting somebody good go up. Uh, so 32, 42, 40. These, this is the same pattern you saw in the cattle example. It's growing. It's growing at a diminishing rate. So what are people going to do here? They're going to enter the contest if they're risk neutral, which I make as a simplifying. They'll take fair gambles. They'll enter the contest if their expected payoff compares favorably with what they could earn if they were a potter. So one guy uh, who's thinking about entering, nobody's entering uh, yet at all. It's his turn first to decide. He says, if I enter, I'm going to win for sure. I'm the only contestant. I'll get 20. That's better than 12. Of course, I'm going to enter. The second guy says, if I enter and win, I'll get 32. But I'm not sure I'm going to win. I've got a 50% chance of winning. My expected payoff is 16. That's still better than 12. I'm going to enter. And so on, all the way down, four contestants are going to enter this market. Everybody chooses freely. Everybody's rational. It's a completely uh, intelligible allocation of resources, except that it's suboptimal. What's the income we see in this market? We got 12 guys competing in the recording contract. The winner gets 48. That's part of the, the country's income. There's one guy who works as a potter. He gets 12. The income altogether, 48 plus 12, that's 60. That was the income we got when people sent their steers out onto the common, according to their best uh, insights as individuals. What's the optimum allocation here? It is not to send four people into the recording contest. Socially optimum means surplus maximizing. What would be the, the number to, of people that we, could, we would send if our goal was to maximize the country's income? Send another contestant only if the increase in the winner's reward uh, is large enough to cover the $12 opportunity cost of the extra contestant not being a potter. So in that case, the optimum number of contestants is just two. The first guy, it pays to send. We're going to get 20. Uh, if, he'd, if we'd send him instead to be a potter, we'd have gotten 12. If we send a second guy, the winner's payment on average goes up by 12 from 20 to 32. That's just enough to compensate for the fact that that guy couldn't make pots, and we lost 12 by virtue of sending him into the contest. Two is the surplus maximizing amount. It's actually a tie. You get the same surplus with one or two, but we'll settle ties in favor of, of being singers rather than uh, potters, just as we did in the case of the kettle uh, example. The income, if we can restrain entry here uh, into the, the singing contest, would be higher, just as it was in the, in the earlier example of the tragedy of the commons. 
we'd have 68 if we could keep people from entering as much as they wanted to. That's what happens uh, when you let people do what they want to do. You get too many entrants into the sing contest. The winning singer is too good in economic terms. People who aren't economists don't like sentences like that. The winning singer is too good. What, what do these economists, these tone-deaf economists, know about art and, and appreciating aesthetic? The point is, we do have an interest in singing quality, but only up to a point. If we could get better sing, singing quality for less than the cost of getting it, we would want to do that. But once we've sent two people in, sending a third people in costs us more than the value of the extra quality we're going to get by doing that. So we say, no, that's enough. If you wanted maximum singing quality, you'd have everybody compete in the singing contest. There'd be nobody left to do anything useful uh, uh, besides that. OK. But again, as I said, overcrowding is way worse than indicated by the assumption that people think they're equally likely to win. Here's what Adam Smith had to say. The contempt of risk and the presumptuous hope of success are in no period of life more active than at the age at which young people choose their professions. <laughs> that is to say, at your age, uh, you all think you're going to win uh, when you go out there. Some of you will win, but the odds you assign to winning are probably higher than the actual odds will prove to be. That's just a fact about human nature. How do we know? It's true in every domain. We see what's called the Lake Wobegon effect. People think they're all above average. Uh, they're not all above average. That's mathematically impossible. 60% of NCAA Division I basketball starters think they're going to start in the NBA. Huh. <laughs> the true percentage of those players who start in the NBA is 5%. 13 to 1 difference. in the, Most people think they're more intelligent than the average person. Most people, 90% of drivers, think they're better drivers than the average driver. That can't be true. <laughs> There's one sample uh, that was investigated. People were in the, ac in the hospital recovering from accidents they'd caused. 80% plus of them thought they were better than average drivers. Uh, it's a very, very widespread tendency, this, this tendency. Workers, if you ask them to rate themselves on a productivity scale in percentile terms, they'll get an average self-assessment, 77th percentile. That's the average assessment. 90% say they're above the median. That can't be right. 50% are above the median. 90% say they're above the median. 2% of high school seniors reported that they had below average leadership ability. The more vague the trait, the, the more one-sided the optimism gets to be. 1% uh, of high school uh, seniors thought they were below average in terms of their ability to get along with other people. Where do, where do I stand on that domain? Uh, I don't know. I'm, I'm, but I'm surely above average on that. It does not seem to be a bias that goes away with additional advanced training. 94% of university professors reported that they were better at their jobs than their average colleague. Uh, none of this is true, of course, as people would recognize if you asked them to confront these numbers, they would realize it couldn't be true of everyone. They might still think it true of them, but they, they would acknowledge it can't be true of everyone. But that means that the degree of excess entry into tournaments like the ones I was describing will be way worse than we would see if everybody thought they were equally likely to win. People don't think they're equally likely to win. They think they're more likely than others to win. So now let's ask, what would happen if we tried to attack inequality by making the after-tax income less unequal than the before-tax income. In Sweden, the pre-tax income distribution is about the same as it is in the United States in terms of income inequality. Most people are surprised to hear that. 
the after-tax distribution of income in Sweden is much less unequal than the after-tax distribution of income in the United States. If we had higher taxes on the people whose incomes have grown the most, the income distribution here would be less unequal than it is. People will say, oh, we really would love to do that, but we can't because the economy would go to hell in a handbasket if we did that. All the movers and shakers would quit expending effort to make the economy grow. Okay, examine that proposition critically if you think the top incomes were generated, uh, disproportionately at least, if not in every case, in winner-take-all markets, markets in which there was too much entry into those markets in the first place. Let's do an example where we put a tax on the winning singer. Uh, this is going to be analogous to the tax on the cattle growers in the earlier example. Uh, I've seen the numbers, so I picked the tax to be 25%, the same as in the other example. Uh, that means your new decision rule is enter the same contest if your after-tax return is going to be at least as much as you could get by being a pot potter, which is 12, which isn't taxed. So if you can't get that much, work as a potter. Look what happens. Now the after-tax return to the winning singer, uh, if there are two contestants, is uh, not 32, it's 24. There are two people who might be the winning singer if there are two contestants. The expected return uh, to each of them is 12. That's just enough to get them to volunteer to compete in the recording contract. And so now income is going to be 60, uh, it, th the, the three potters are going to earn 36, the, the, the winning singer is going to get 24 after tax, and the, the, the tax on the government, uh, uh, that the government gets to build roads and the like is going to be $8, $68 of income, not the 60 that we had when people could enter as much as they wanted to enter without any tax. So it's an empirical question. Could we tax people at the top and not send the economy down the toilet? Maybe. Maybe not. But it's not for sure that we would send the economy down the toilet uh, if we did that. Other economies have done it. Most other economies tax, tax the highest in incomes more heavily than we do. And they haven't gone down the toilet. Uh, so it, it at least ought to be something to think about with an eye toward what the evidence says would happen if we did that. Not by shouting slogans about what would happen if we did that. Slogans don't, don't really tell you what would happen. Oh, the, the, the makers would go on strike. Uh, the 43 vice presidents who want to be the CEO would knock off at 1 in the afternoon on Fridays and play golf if we raise their tax rate a little bit. OK, that's a testable claim. Their taxes used to be much higher. And they didn't knock off at 1 o'clock on Friday. That might be informative uh, about, in part about what would happen. We, we, we know how to, to test claims of that sort. Positional externalities matter in the labor market. We've talked about a couple of examples of that. Safety regulation is a simple one. You're a young parent. You want to send your kid to a better school. You need to get more money so you can bid more effectively for a house in a better school district. How could I do that? Well, I could go work for a tobacco company. Uh, I could, uh, I could uh, work for a, a sanitation company. Uh, I, I could take some kind of unpleasant job. Or I could take a, a dangerous job. That's another way to get extra money. What we know is that every country in the, in the world puts limits on how much risk you can take uh, in the workplace. They try to put uh, ceilings on the amount of exposure to risk that they permit in the workplace. They, they typically don't do a very good job of that. They're clumsy about it. But everybody does it. Is that misguided? Milton Friedman says it's misguided. You've got people who want to take extra risks for extra money. You've got employers who are willing to pay them to take extra risks for, for extra money. Why don't you let those people make the deal, deal that they want to make? That's what he says. And one possible answer is that if everybody makes that deal, they won't get anything out of it. They'll all end up working in riskier jobs. They'll get extra money. They'll use that extra money to bid for houses in better school districts. 
And what will happen at the end of the day when the dust settles is that they will have bid up the prices of the houses in the better school districts. And nobody will go to a better school than before. Half of all kids are still going to go to bottom half schools. And so rather than see that, maybe uh, societies are at least implicitly deciding, let's put limits on the amount people can risk their lives and, and safety in the workplace. We like that better. People have proposed eliminating those regulations. They don't get elected. There must be something about those regulations that's adaptive. What's the explanation? Could be partly that it helps solve that battle for position. The choice of how many hours to work. A lot of you are going to end up working 100 hours a week. The Fair Labor Standards Act says you're not allowed to work more than 40 hours a week or they have to pay you overtime. If you're in a salaried position, you're not affected by that regulation. We know that in law firms, uh, when we give surveys, would you uh, uh, approve if the law firm said, we're going to cut back your pay by 10%, but we're going to cut back your hours by 10%? Would you approve of that? 90% of the associates say yes. Yes, I'd like you to do that. Would you do that if you were offered the choice to do that? No. No. I'd, I'd brand myself as a slacker if I did that. But if the firm did that, if the firm offered us 10% lower hours, and 10, oh, I'd love to have that option. Uh, and some f firms are experimenting with that. Uh, when you shop for a place to work, if all you're shopping for is the maximum pay, you're not going to be attentive to what do they want me to do? The what do they want me to do exactly question. If the pay seems too good to be true, maybe it is too good to be true. Maybe they want you to do things that most people wouldn't want to do. Uh, so when you're evaluating your offers, think about what they want you to do in addition to how much they want to pay you. Uh, Pay is important. Yes, you have loans to pay. Yes. But you really, life is about more than pay. It's about what you're doing during the day. It's about how long you have available to spend with your family. Are, are you able to uh, visit your parents during holidays? You know, all those things are part of a life too. And if you look only at the pay that they're offering, you don't see those things. Uh, so I, I say that to you. Uh, with no illusion that you're going to hear me. Uh, how, what, what'd you get? Uh, that's the answer, that, that's the answer uh, to the question uh, people are interested in. Uh, how much are you going to get paid? But there's an inverse relationship between how much you get paid and lots of negative aspects of what they want you to do. That's, that's the big, big message from the theory of labor markets. You could work longer hours. Uh, we don't, we, we've protected hourly workers from the fact that if they work longer hours uh, to get money to bid for a house in a better school district, nothing happens as a result of that because it's self-canceling. Uh, we haven't protected you because you're a salaried worker. If you want protection against the arms race that you're going to find yourself embroiled in, you'll have to figure out how to get it on your own. I don't have any advice for you. but. It would be useful to know that there is uh, a signaling battle going on out there and that uh, maybe somebody will come up with proposals for how to ameliorate it, and you might want to be attentive to that. Yeah, uh, yeah, let me talk about going to work for a firm that has a plan for how to deal with that. I don't know if anybody has a plan. The last thing I want to take up with you is another dimension that you're going to confront when you have several offers to weigh. This is uh, the, the notion that there are compensating differentials that accompany where you rank in the group, group that you're going to decide to join. All the conclusions from this example follow very simply from two assumptions that I think most people find reasonable. Workers value having high rank relative to their coworkers. No firm can make you work for it if you don't want to. OK, these are fairly innocuous assumptions. Um, take, take it to the, the intergalactic level. 
where would you rather live? Uh, in a world where you earned a million dollars a year and you were in the bottom 1% of the income distribution, everybody else earns at least eight or nine million, some earn uh, several hundred million, but you earn a million dollars a year, you'd, you'd, be, you'd be able to spend more than you are used to being able to spend here, but you live in a neighborhood, even though your house is pretty nice, other parents don't want their kids to come play with your kids. Uh, your colleagues uh, tell a joke, everybody laughs, you don't get it. Uh, uh, you're on the bottom of the heap, uh, but you have a lot of money. Alternative, you earn $100,000 a year, but you're in the top 5%. Uh, your house isn't as big, but uh, it's in a good school district. Uh, other parents uh, hope their kids will get invited over your kids uh, to play after school. Uh, uh, you tell a joke, others laugh. Some people don't get it. It's not, you know. <laughs> it's not bizarre to care about where you rank in the group, is my only point uh, with, with that example. So here, here's the conclusion. If you, if you believe these two assumptions, workers are going to get paid extra if they're in the bottom half of a group. Think about the group you last worked in. Think about the three worst people in the group, the three least productive people. What would happen to the group's mission if those people were struck by lightning on their way home from work one day? Yeah, maybe you'd lose some output. Uh, th hold that thought. Now think about the two most productive workers in your group. What would happen to the group's mission if they were struck by lightning on the way home? Most people say, wow, the group would fall apart if the three best people were to leave. The three worst people, maybe we'd produce more if they weren't uh, clogging up the works. Uh, what should be true in general if the, th if the two best ones are worth more to the group than the three worst ones are worth to the group is that the two best ones together earn more than the three worst ones earn. But that's not true in any group any of you have worked in if we keep the age distribution uh, controlled for. In the, the, th the, three, the wages are so compressed within the group that the three worst guys are going to earn more in total than the two best guys. So that's the way the wage structure is out in the world. Uh, that's not an exaggeration to say. Why is it that way? This model proposes a no cash on the table explanation for that fact about the world. So that's where this is, is headed. OK, we've got a smart guy, Holmes. He's productive. He makes 100 bricks an hour. Bricks are worth 10 cents, just like in the earlier example. He'd be willing to give up 30% of his pay to be in the top half of a group. So if it were a two-person group, that would just mean being better than the other guy. He'd be willing to be in the bottom half, but you'd have to give him 30% of his pay uh, to, to compensate him for the disamenity of that. Watson's not so productive. He only makes 50 bricks an hour, uh, which is, uh, again, a 10 cents a brick worth, objectively, $5 an hour. He'd be willing to give up 30% of his worth in order to be in the top half. He'd be willing to accept 30% as a compensating payment for agreeing to be in the bottom half. Working alone, you're not in the top half or the bottom half. If you don't join a group with uh, people who are not like you, you're not better than anybody and you're not worse than anybody. Holmes and Watson, Watson here could work separately and each earn $5 and $10 respectively. Uh, $10 for Holmes, $5 for Wat Watson. Would they work together if they were paid those amounts? The answer is no. Holmes would be willing to do it. He'd get $10 an hour, the same as he'd get working in the loan, but he'd also get something else of value. He would get to be in the top half of his group. Watson, however, would take a dim view of the offer described in these terms. He would say, I can earn $5 working on my own. I won't be in the bottom half of the group if I work on my own. If I come work here for $5 an hour, I get no more money, and I'm the dumbest guy in the group. What's the upside, he says. So he says, I'm working on my own, if that's the terms of employment. 
but they can both do better if we get them together. Why? Because we know that Holmes is willing to pay $3 to be in the top half, and Watson would be willing to supply a top half position by agreeing, in effect, to occupy the bottom half position without with which a top half position couldn't exist for as little as $1.50 an hour. So they would be able to work together uh, and we would be able to pay them as little as thirteen fifty an hour. That's the reservation price for homes. It's the ten dollars he's worth on his own minus the three dollars he'd be willing to pay to be in the top half. That's Watch Watson's reservation price. He could make five dollars on his own. You want him to be in the top half? You got to give him thirty percent premium. That's six fifty. That adds up to thirteen fifty, and together they're worth fifteen dollars total. And so there's more than enough to pay them uh, in excess of their reservation wages. And we could give them, in this case, 75 cents of surplus each. The resulting wage distribution would be very compressed. They're, they're not, the top guy's not earning much less, much more than the bottom guy. And they're all happy with the deal. If somebody said to Watson, come join us, we'll pay you more. There's no deal they could offer him that would get him to leave this, this firm, that would still make money for the firm making the offer. My son, uh, one of my sons, is a framing uh, com contractor. His crew of 20, they build frames for the, the, the mansions going up along the front range in, out north of Denver. Some of the guys in his crew can erect three times as many feet of wall in a day as other guys in his crew. He's happy to keep them all on the payroll. The ones who are three times as productive as the others get 15% more than the others. That's the way pay payroll patterns are in the private sector. They're taxing the rich guys in the firm and they're giving welfare payments to the poor guys in the firm. That's and it's all voluntary. It's a completely uh, consensual agreement. Why? Because being in the bottom half is burdensome. People don't like to be in the bottom half. You want to hold things together, you got to make it attractive to everybody. If you don't have a, somebody in the bottom half, there can't be anybody in the top half. Did anybody not realize that? You want to have a voluntary firm? It's got to be attractive to everybody. And if being in the bottom half is unattractive, then you're stuck. You've got to have some compensating differential that reflects people's ranks. And so this is the choice you'll face. I'll t keep you one more minute. Uh, your productivity is here. Where should I work? Should I work in this slow lane firm? I'll get a, a lower wage if I do that. Should I work in a medium lane firm? The productivity on average is higher there. I'll be right in the middle of the wage distribution there. Or I could go be the least well paid uh, guy in the fast lane firm. Where should I go? It depends on how you feel about this. There's no correct answer. If you care about local rank a lot, this might be your best choice. You're not going to get paid as much as you're worth in some objective sense, but the, the high rank is worth it to you. If you're not so concerned about it, maybe B would look like a better choice. You're going to get paid more there. If you really don't care about your local rank, what's the best option for you? C, take me. You want to make fun of me because I'm stupider than you? Ha, huh. I'm, I'm happy to, to supply that service in return for the premium wage that you're willing to pay me. So wages differ for a whole lot of reasons. Uh, you, if you're not aware of why they differ, you're not going to be able to make an intelligent choice among all the options that you face in the labor market. And that's what I wanted you to know.